Good morning, church. It's good to be with you this morning. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> I should tell you I got here this morning. My, I go to Sligo Church. And my brethren there, I'm not sure they're too happy with me. <laughs> um, I haven't been there this year. And uh, I'm at prayer meeting online. But so this Sabbath, thank you, Rob. I was scheduled to teach Sabbath school. I said, yikes. Just then I got the email from Patty, where's your sermon title and scripture? Oh, gee. I had to change that. So I, I exercised what I call the Wanderers Clause. Or Sabbath school class is called the Wanderers. It's made up of a lot of people who travel a lot. And so we kind of rotate to teaching. So I exercise my wandering privileges, and I'm with you this morning. So I hope if you see me on a regular basis, you know I'm banished from Sligo. But I'm thankful to Dr. Roy Adams, who decided to help me out this past Sabbath and teach Sabbath school. Let us pray as we open God's word. Father, oh, we need you as our praise team led us. It's you are our righteousness. And as we open your word, may our hearts and our ears and our understanding be deepened. And may we be transformed from your word today. Amen. I travel to work on the metro. I'm an urban person. I park, get on the metro. I work in Alexandria, Virginia. I use that for a reason, actually, because I call it, it allows me to compound my time. Instead of me wrestling with traffic, I can be doing stuff. You know the trains are at 6 o'clock in the morning, there hardly anyone on it. So you can have really good thinking time and prayer time and the like. And so that's the way I travel. But on yesterday morning, I had an experience that actually I was thinking through framing the sermon for today that actually changed my, my framing of the sermon. I had an experience in a gentleman for the third time on the metro in two weeks. I call him the Metro Wanderer. He comes on with four bags and he takes one bag and he places it in the door of the train that it won't close while he gets his other bags on. So it takes him a little time to be able to get all of his stuff in the train. So it's four bags of plastic and he has an umbrella, blue and white, wrapped in plastic. When you see this gentleman, he grabs your attention because on his face there's a quiet dignity to him. He never says anything to anyone else, gets his bags on, and he just sits there. But along with his quiet dignity, and he's, he's clearly a homeless person, um, he never begs, and there's a very vivid, pungent smell to him. But folks I've noticed seem to have known him and never try to shun him and bear the scent because they did not want to undermine his dignity. So we traveled. I was right next to the, to the door. I, I'm very strategic what car I sit in because I like to get out, get and make the other connection to the train. And so I walked to another car because I know his bags were in the front to be able to get out in time. And I got out to make the other connection to the train. As I was getting on my train, I saw him coming down the escalator with his bags, put two on at a time, and he's getting on to a train gun in the opposite direction. Destination unknown. It got me thinking about journeys, about destination. Here we are at the first end of the first month of a new year. How's been your life journey this first month? Here we are in here in dreary January. The warmth and the festivities of 
December and November are over, and we have the drab, dull winter coldness to deal with. Bills and the mental hangover of the holidays. How are you doing? Is your walk a walk of intentional purpose, or like that gentleman, wandering with unfocused barrenness? That's the challenge, not just for him, but for you and I this morning. So, let's see if I get this thing working here. We're going to put our spiritual Nikes on, I guess, this year, and to make some destination that matters in our lives. The poet Robert Frost frames it for us in a very powerful, haunting poem, The Road Less Traveled. Two roads diverge into the woods, and they took the one less traveled, and it made all the difference in the world. Jesus was not as poetic when he declared something very similar. In Matthew 7 and verse 13, he declared, Enter the narrow gate, for the gate which is wide is the easy way that leads to destructions, and those who enter there are many. This morning, our time together in the world, we'll be examining the life of one gentleman who chose the right path and the right company. His name is Enoch. Enoch. What do you know about Enoch? Not a lot of verses. Simone read the scripture this morning for us. Three verses, and there's one in Hebrews. Hebrews 11, verse 5, is the other verse that talks about Enoch. But he must be some kind of superstar, because my daughter named her grandson all after him. So, so what's so special about this gentleman? Hebrews 11 and verse 5. Enoch. By faith, Enoch was taken from this world, of which he did not experience death. He could not have been found because God had taken him away, for before he was taken, he was commended for as one that pleased God. If you know anything about, Gen about Hebrews 11, it's a hall of fame of faith, right? Abel by faith, Enoch by faith, Noah by faith, Abraham by faith. In each case, if you carefully look at that scripture, the first seven verses of Hebrews 11, you see it, an active verb is involved. Abel offered by faith, Noah built by faith. Abraham obeyed by faith. But when it comes to Enoch, a passive verb is used. In the situation, by faith, Enoch was taken by God. In other words, the verse did not tell us what Enoch did to make it into the Hall of Fame of Faith. Not here. That's why we need to go back to the Old Testament to the scripture reading of the morning found in Genesis 5, verses 21 to 24, where it talks about that Enoch walked with God. You may say, big deal. I walk with my neighbor every morning. Is it? What is it to walk with God? And why is this so special that the right of the Hebrews would place Enoch in such a high regard. The first time this idea of walking is mentioned in the Bible comes in Genesis 8, Genesis 3, I'm sorry, and verse 8. Genesis 3 and verse 8, if you'd like to follow along. It comes right after this disobedience of Adam and Eve. 
said that God, Lord God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife And the man and his wife heard the sound and they hid their face from the Lord. Let me see if I get it. There it is. The first time walk is mentioned, God came looking for Adam and Eve, and they were hiding from him. Let's unpack this law. And see what it tells us. First it tells us that God hears the creator of the universe who by the power of his word created all of this. And he was intentional about walking with his people every evening in the cool of the day. What does that say to you? He wanted intimacy. He wanted to be close to us. And when sin occurred, Adam and Eve could not stand that intimacy anymore. And they had to hide themselves. The God who holds the world together wanted to walk with them. Wanted to find out, how was your day? Tell me what's on your heart. Let me tell you what's on my heart. Is there anything more precious than that? At the end of the day, to have that kind of conversation with a loved one? And here they are hiding from God. Our value system actually expresses this hiding from God. This week, one of the major news stories was that the Senate was discussing what happened to Ticketmaster and Taylor Swift last year. Imagine that. We give more attention to celebrities than we do to the God of heaven who wants to walk with us. So I did some research, I was curious. What would it cost to go to a Taylor Swift concert? Let me tell you the cheapest ticket. If you're in the parking lot, not in the stadium, in the parking lot, $284. Just to be able to hear or sing. But here's the God of heaven who wants intimacy with us. And we may not give him that kind of possibility in our lives. That's how much sin has caused the distance between us and him. But then we see some of the consequences of this decision. Because the, the estrangement that took place with God continued. If you look at Genesis 3 and Genesis 4, you can see the increase in estrangement. First, they blame each other. They were at war with creation. And then in Genesis 4, the first murder took place. We're against each other. Then comes Genesis 5. And in Genesis 5, as the scripture reading says, Enoch walked with God. What is that saying to you? After the loneliness, the estrangement, the distance, here is a man walking with God. There's a lot of hope in that statement because if you're walking with God, that means reconciliation of some sort must have taken place and that's what's mentioned in Hebrews, by faith. Enoch walked with God. Usually, as we saw in the behavior of Adam and Eve, when you wrong someone, you kind of avoid them, right? If you see them coming this way, you go that way. Isn't that the way we behave? That's, we got that. It's in our DNA, folks, right from the beginning. So for this walking of Enoch with God, some reconciliation had taken place. And how long did it last? He was our old when this happened. 
he was 65, and it, he walked with God for how many years? 300 years. Just imagine that. To me, I find such a rich promise in that possibility. Walking with God for 300 years. And then he was taken with that death to heaven. It gives us hope. It gives us hope that one day we will be walking with God. One day we won't feel the sting of death. One day we'll be fully reconciled with our God. But for us to understand and to appreciate this, we have to understand also that reconciliation means that there must, not just estrangement, there's a war happening. We always Adventists talk about the great controversy and all between Christ and Satan. I'm going to bring it down to make it personal. A war with our God. You and I is war with our God. And let me illustrate that. When somebody gives you, say, Ten Commandments, and you decide which ones you're going to obey, <laughs> there are two issues at stake there. One is your association with that person who gave you the command, and then your association with the principal involved in it. So, if you are in charge, you can decide if you're going to obey that or not, because now it's not a master-slave relationship. You're, he's just an advisor to you. Okay, I don't like that one, so I will put it aside. So your relationship with God, say, instead of you being in charge of my life, um, that's fine, I don't like this one, I'll put it aside. And then there's the breaking of the law itself. And so the dynamics of that just plays out in all kind of circumstances that we've seen in our lives. So we, when God is not on the throne of our lives, we are actually at war with it. And we need to look at it in those circumstances as we rationalize it. War has propaganda involved in it. Let's look at the war in Ukraine and Russia. If you're Russian, you're not even sure if you're in the country. These are guys, who's the bad guys here? There's always a just and unjust guy. But the unjust guy always have propaganda to share to justify his position. We see it play out with Adam and Eve. It's your fault, God. We're in this mess. You gave me this woman. It's your fault, God. You gave me the snake in the garden. We're very good at rationalizing, aren't we? Rationalizing our action. And we do that over and over and over again, and that's really constitute war with God. So because of that, God had to set some rules in place. And this represents the banishment of Adam and Eve from the garden. He could not let evil and sin have its course indefinitely. But in the middle of it, he sent them a promise. Genesis 3.15 talks about the Savior coming. He's going to bruise his heel, but he's going to get him. And so from that, the promise was embedded there, although sin was having its course throughout this creation. But every family knew that. Never, is this son or daughter going to be the Savior? Adam and Eve knew it. All of the patriots knew it. And they look with expectancy for that to happen. But here it is. Enoch practicing that. There are two elements to being with God. When you reconcile, 
you have a peace that's a part of that. You have, a, you have two peace. You have the presence of God and you have the peace of God. Those are priceless treasures. The presence of God and the peace of God. And that's what Enoch had for 300 years. We are social creatures. And even our secular sounds talk about togetherness. For, for, for those of us, all the ones, do you know the song Side by Side? Right? You don't know about tomorrow, whether it's trouble or sorrow. But if we travel the road, sharing a load, side by side, through all kinds of weather, not if the sky should fall, as long as we are together, it does not matter at all. When we have that sense of support and encouragement and not aloneness, it makes all the difference in the world. And God offers us that. And here is Enoch walking with God, experiencing a God, and that's why he was one of the great heroes of faith. How's our walk this morning? Are we wondering? Are we intentional about our walk? Have we abrogated God's position in our lives, or is he leading that walk? Do we have his presence and our peace in our lives as we walk? Makes all the difference in the world. Are we justifying our position? Are we saying, yes, Lord, we at war with your help? Makes all the difference in the world. Enoch walked with God. And he looked forward to that day. There's another person who shares this idea of we being at war with God. It's the Apostle Paul. You remember his Damascus Road experience? And what did God say to him? Why persecutest thou me? Here is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians to talk about his reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 19. God, who in Christ reconciled in the world to himself, not counting their sins to us, so that we, Christ's ambassadors, as Paul, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled with God. For God made him sin, who knew no sin, that we might have righteousness in God in him. What is Paul saying? God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting our sins against him. He had said that he took what was our sin against God to himself. He came and provided the legal justice to rescue us from our situation. What a God. But we talk about the presence of God. How about the peace of God? The peace that God gives us even in our toughest circumstances. Acts 7 is a great illustration of this. This is Stephen, the stoning of Stephen. The artist does such justice to it. Acts 7 talks about the stoning of Stephen. Did Stephen, is he cowering? He had a peace, even in the toughest situation faced with martyrdom. We are not faced with martyrdom in all daily circumstances. So God has the resources to give us the peace, even as he gave the peace to Stephen because of that relationship that he had with him. The presence of God, the peace of God, gives us the intimacy that God wants with his people. So the peace is the practice 
of the presence of God in us because we know we're dependent on him even in dire circumstances, even to death. So every action we take, every step we take, we're taking a journey, either back to the garden. So where did Israel go from? We went from the desert to where? Back to the lush land, didn't they? Ah, oh. we're going to Zion, we tell her, we sing. We're trying to get back to the garden. God had banished them to the desert place from the garden and made a way for them to get back. So every action we take, we're making a journey decision. Are we staying in the desert? Are we going back to the garden? There's a popular song that you all know that gives us an invitation. And it doesn't have this group thing. It says, I come to the garden alone while the Jew is still on the roses. And the voice I hear calling out my the Son of God. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I'm his own for the joy we share as we gather there. None other can ever know. And it goes on to paint an idyllic possibility for you and I. By faith, Enoch walked with God. By faith, you and I can walk with God. We can have his presence. We can have his peace. But it's for us to decide, is he going to be in charge of our lives or not? Are we going to be reconciled with him? Decision Robert Frost captured so well in this poem. Two roads divide in the woods, and I took the one less traveled, and it made all the difference in the world. We're faced with that decision every day, you and I, as we surrender and we decide to walk with the Lord. Sometimes we substitute the walk and the talking with God, so okay, I studied my Sabbath school last night, did this. You kidding me? It's not about a checklist. It's about the intimacy. It's about walking like you walk with your best friend and you listen to each other. And that's just offer prayer. See you, Lord, next, tomorrow. All right, I did pray today, didn't I? That's not intimacy. It's not transactional. It's relational, folks. And so when we know we're not having a checklist, but we just want to be in the Savior's presence. It makes all the difference in the world. So today, as we sing our closing song, the closing song is actually a prayer. Oh, Master, let me walk with thee. We're telling the Savior, yes, we're surrendered. Yes, we want to be reconciled. So pray singers, come join us and lead us as we sing this prayer. We want to be reconciled and we want relationship. We want to walk in 2023 as we start a new month to be intentional and purposeful and not wandering. Lord, give us the power as such. Amen. <laughs>